The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Thank you, Gene, and welcome everybody to show number 18 of As We See It, being recorded on Tuesday, November 22nd, 2011. We're running a couple days late because Skype had an issue this past Sunday. We're going to just jump right into things because uh, we have a full docket here today. Um, we have Fred Boaz out in the uh, Pocono Mountain Studios. Holly Hurley is in a car on her way to Chicago. And joining us from the San Francisco, Oakland Bay area of Northern California is our BaseNet producer, host, Jessica Moskowitz. Uh, so we're going to just jump right in with this first story here about the uh, sit-ins, stand-ins, whatever we want to call them, takeovers at uh, UC Berkeley and uh, UC Davis. Holly, why don't you uh, start the conversation and let's get Jess going because uh, she's on a uh, short rope here. All right. Well, you know, apparently these students were uh, peacefully doing a sit-in and, uh, and a police officer claiming he was agitated by the people who were circling him sprayed the seated protesters uh, with pepper spray in the face and uh, it was caught on camera and they have put him on paid leave in the interim and basically they're just trying to decide what to do with him and I'd love to hear what Jeff has to say about it. Oh, well, thanks, Holly. I'm, uh, I'm super, um, super honored that you guys asked me to come on and talk about this, even though I only had a few minutes today. Um, but I am in the Bay Area, um, and this has been a topic of discussion on everybody's minds and on everybody's mouths out here um, for the past few weeks. Uh, I work in Oakland, and the Occupy Oakland stuff was going on before this, um, and now that that has sort of slowed down a little bit. We've got the campuses, the local campuses, really starting to um, mobilize with this movement. And we've been seeing the violence that's been happening. I mean, I live, I live uh, a few blocks away from UC Berkeley um, in the evening that there was a sort of a, a, a confrontation that, that night. It was a couple weeks ago. It was very bad. There were choppers flying over the neighborhood. Um, Everybody talked about it the next day. There was all kinds of stuff going on around that. And then at UC Davis, is kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, we have footage that's been go going viral now that's showing these uh, campus police, which are actually the campus police, not the, not the state or uh, local police, but they're campus police, that were spraying, as Holly said, pepper spray right into peaceful protesters' faces. Um, and the footage that we have is that these people were literally sitting on the ground, Indian style, if you will, and uh, not doing anything but just sitting. And uh, the, the campus police pepper sprayed them, some right in the face, in the mouth, held up their arms and sprayed where they were trying to cover their face with their clothes and stuff. So people out here are outraged. And, and you know, that's, that's how I see it. Yeah, after we have to let you go, we're going to discuss, bring everybody up to date because the... Uh, UC Davis campus police department chief has since been placed on, or I don't know if she was placed on or went on voluntary leave. Um, so, you know, we'll bring everybody up to date on all of that. Uh, Holly or Fred, any other questions for Jess before we have to let her go? That was a really good um, bringing us up to date, um, you know, with somebody that we have boots on the ground, so to speak, right the there in Oakland. Well, the only well actually, I have just, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask, um, in this area, do you feel like this was sort of, uh, it was almost like this is a fire that's been kindling and this was the spark that set off the explosion? I mean, what were the tensions like before this incident? It was, it was bad, Holly. I've got to tell you that, um, you know, I work in Oakland, but my, my boyfriend, uh, it's actually his birthday today, so I'm rushing off to a birthday dinner as soon as I uh, leave you folks, um, but uh, he works right across the street from City Hall in Oakland. So when the Occupy Oakland stuff started to go underway, we had a, a gentleman who was apparently a, a military veteran who was struck in the face with a non-lethal weapon, which is, all, you know, pepper spray is also considered non, a non-lethal weapon, um, but it was a rubber bullet, and it hit him in the head, um, and he suffered severe uh, trauma to his, to his head, to his brain and stuff. 
And I'm not actually sure what's going on with him at this point, if he's still alive. I believe he survived the incident um, and is just recovering. But that was that was when it all where it all came from, Holly and and Fred and Ed and Larry, because it uh, it was really disturbing that this poor gentleman had gotten struck in the face with what cops claimed to say was something completely uh, not lethal and harmless. And she was injured very badly, and so people started to get angry. What, I think what that's I, where what it all... I know, what I know we wanted to cover, and we'll discuss it once you leave. I just want to get your opinion on it, if any. Um, we're going to bring up the fact that these people, we're speaking of specifically of this Oakland, whether it's Davis or Berkeley uh, situation, not these sit-ins that are going on in other places in the country. This one in exactly. particular, they were apparently a week before they were moved out, they were giving eviction notices saying, look, on, you know, let's say noontime on Wednesday, you're going to have to be out of here. And they stayed anyway. And the police are yep. saying that's why they had to go in and forcefully evict these people. What do you say on that? Well, I, I think that, like I said, I think it all, like, back to Holly's question, I think it all started when, when the cops started to turn violence against these protesters. And it's just kind of seeping into the, I mean, uh, we see a lot like back in the, in the past and, and stuff during around uh, the time of Vietnam, the campuses, the college campuses are great places for people to get together in a community style and really voice their opinions and rally together. So I think it's very natural that this is happening at the, at the university level uh, where people have, are coming together and kind of commiserating with each other. But this thing that happened at UC Davis was ridiculous. They, they basically lined up on, and sat on the ground for the, I think it was the, the dean or the commissioner, I'm sure you guys have the facts there um, that maybe you can mention, but um, they lined the, the ground to her car and did sort of a walk of shame. And it was completely and utterly peaceful. And these campus police officers just said, mm, sorry, we told you you had to go. And that's where we are now. Okay, yeah, I guess what I'm what I was leading at was and we are not trying to take a side either on the protesters or on the side of the uh you know authorities just trying to get to the yeah. bottom of it. Um we don't we don't feel speaking collectively that these protesters didn't overstay their welcome. I'm just I'm just looking at that if they were given eviction notices and they defied the eviction notice, didn't they have coming to them whatever they had coming to them? Well, I think I think what Jessica was saying is that this was a symptom of a larger problem. You know, these this is not the only protest going on right now, and this is not the only open show of violence of by not. the authorities who are feeling exactly. overwhelmed. And this has been a, I think what she was saying to that point was that this is, this is a symptom of a bigger problem, a longer standing problem, and something that was coming to a head. I would think, yeah. I mean, I'm going to throw it to you. <laughs> sure. Fred, anything yeah. before we have to let Jess go? Yeah, well, it, it's just you know these you gotta understand something they, that they're in a they are still in a public a public location and they were they were given a legal order to evict and refused to leave that is violating the law. Now the police were wrong going in there going after a peaceful demonstration with pepper spray, but equally wrong are the students who are there in violation of an eviction notice. I mean, nowhere do they have the right to block people's cars, block entrances, block people's movement for where they're going for their movement. But does that give but that, does that give the the authorities the right to take action? If, even if both parties were wrong, I mean, it's the way that they went about it that I think is what's angering so many people here in Northern California. Oh, I, I didn't say they have a right to do that. Just that the students are also uh, are are not are not blameless. Cul yeah, cul on. culpability on both sides. It's culpability on both sides, and nobody's yeah. looking at that. Nobody's looking at that. Well, we we are going to play a clip. Um, well, but I, I do th I do think that the, the, it's important to examine the fact that there's also a step outside of protocol here and a step outside of the rights of that particular officer in that they're only allowed to use that level of force if they're actually being threatened, and the video footage makes it very clear they're not being that threatened. That they weren't being so threatened because, just like Jessica precisely. said, they I were mean, sitting there. Illegal or not story. illegal, sure, maybe they had the right to take these people into custody, but they didn't have the right to spray them with pepper spray or shoot them or hit them with a billy club or do anything like that. We, they have to be, and I mean, it's sad for our officers because sometimes they're placed in, in events of, of significant stress, but this particular officer acted in a, what was considered an assault, basically, 
to someone who is being nonviolent to them. Uh, then fortunately they're not, or maybe fortunately for most of us, they're not allowed to dis discharge any level of weapon, even pepper spray, unless they're under immediate threat. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and that, that goes right, back right. to what Jess said at the beginning, that they were sitting there cross-legged Indian style, um, you know, posing no physical threat to anybody. And you've got to understand, right. and, they, and there is video footage on that. There's very, there's very, very strong graphic video footage of that that's been circulating, and I think people are just seeing, starting to see it for the first time in other parts of the country. And uh, you know, it's been posted, it's been put up on places like The Daily Show, all the mainstream media is covering it, and people are very disturbed. And you've got to, you've got to understand, um, you know, since I've been out here in California, I've learned of an incident that happened with the BART police. BART is our Bay Area Rapid Transit, our, our tra one of our transit systems. Um, once they have their own police system. Now, I know that's not the same in New York. NYPD takes care of New York. I think uh, Boston Police Department takes care of uh, MTA there. So this is a little bit of a different situation here where these are uh, actually hired officers to work for the transit system. And they pulled a taser. Well, they were supposed to be pulling a taser on... Um, somebody, a, a gentleman by the name of Oscar Grant a few years ago, and he died. Um, it was accidentally, it wasn't a taser, it was a, it was an actual gun, and he was shot <laughs> and killed. And he did not have a weapon on him. So it's been a huge deal, and actually a lot of the occupiers that are, the people that are joining this mo movement out here on the West Coast, especially here in, in the Bay Area, um, they're reminiscing a lot about Oscar Grant. And in fact, re reclaimed and took over City Hall Plaza, was named after another individual. They reclaimed it and are calling it Oscar Grant Plaza. So there, there, there's a lot of aggression, deep-seated aggression here for that kind of behavior. So I think when people see that this type of thing is happening, especially by a hired university police officer who may not have the same training as a federal or a state or a local police officer, um, has has committed this action that may not have been the best way to go about it. Jess, great points all, and let us wish you a happy Thanksgiving and uh, wish Matt a happy birthday from all of us here at BaseNet. And that uh, reporting live from Oakland, California, is our producer out there, Jessica Moskowitz. Thanks for having me on the show, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. You too, guys. You too. Oh, that was great hearing from Jessica. I haven't heard from her in a while. Hope she has fun at the party. Anyway, um, we do have a clip from uh, UC Davis we'll uh, get to, and then we'll come back right after that. University police ordering demonstrators to dismantle tents they had pitched in the center of the campus. After a written warning, most of the protesters decided not to budge. Police in riot gear then deployed to clear the tents. One officer used pepper spray on a group of protesters who had tried to block the police. One person was treated in hospital for chemical burns. Ten protesters were arrested on minor charges and released. The tent encampment was sparked by police action earlier in the week at the university's Berkeley campus. Students there who had also been protesting sharp rises in tuition have filed suit against the university charging police brutality. The occupied movement's appearance on University of California campuses has been met with a resolute response from administrators. The Davis police chief said the group could stay on campus for as long as it wants, but that it would be unsafe for them to camp. The whole purpose of this was just to ask them to take the tents down um, and to get the tents down. Responding to demands for her resignation, the university's chancellor called the pepper spray images, quote, chilling to us all. She said a task force of students, faculty, and staff would review both the protest and the police conduct. A lot's been happening. We heard a lot from them. The, uh, the only question I have is how long have these guys, does it, the Holly, do you know how long these guys at UC Davis have been out there? I don't know actually how long they have been out there at the time that uh, the police started pepper spraying them. Um, I, I, I mean, you know, mo mostly, uh, I think, I think really a lot of the outrage comes from, you know, with, uh, especially since all the Occupy, Occupy this and Occupy that, you know, uh, sort of protests have been going on. There have been reports of, you know, pretty much just in general, the police not really knowing how to deal with it. And, you know, one of, one of my friends mentioned recently that 
the the whole, you know, look at Occupy Wall Street. He said, you know, you're really ignoring the power of a grassroots movement. Uh, we were talking about uh, something totally different in class, actually. And I mentioned, it, you know, we had to crash the entire world economy before people would start occupying things. You know, like, I think I think at this point, the, the rage and the sort of, I mean, protesting is the tool of people who have no other tools. You know, it's, it's the one thing that you can do that's legal that lets your voice be heard aside from the outside of the vote, which only happens so many, every so many years, you know, every two years for the midterms, every four years for the, for the big election. And it's really your only way to be heard in the interim, you know, especially by your local authorities and the people who are actually there. And I, I just, it, it's a very difficult situation sort of on both sides. The key in that I don't necessarily feel like protesting is always the most effective method, but I also do feel that it is our, our right as American. And the fact that it's a nonviolent right is one of the things that I think makes it just especially heinous that all of this, you know, violence has broken out, you know, between Occupy Oakland and now the now the UC Berkeley issue. You know, uh, there, there's there's been a lot of, of issues concerning this and in going into into the protests, and I think that's why this is such big news. Yeah, well, the, the only problem that I have with this, a lot of this stuff, and it's not anything against the kids because I understand what they're doing and why, and what the, what the police did at UC Davis is absolutely wrong. I mean, let's 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 put that the way it is. What they did was wrong. The problem I have is that you know, occupying a place for two and a half months is not occupying. That's residency, and the people at UC Berkeley have a right to tell them you cannot be here. You know, I mean, these guys are all claiming they want to use their First Amendment rights to express themselves. Well, nowhere in the First Amendment, and I have a constant copy of the Constitution with me, nowhere in the First Amendment does it give you the right to block a doorway, block a park. Does it give you the, 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 the right to infringe on someone else's right to enjoy that park on their own without you being there? And, you know, we're getting to the point where people are using the Constitution as a springboard for everything that they want to do, and it said nothing about this in the Constitution. But I think the important thing about you bringing up the Constitution is that it, it, is, it is the right to, happy, to pursuit of happiness, and it's also the right to a lot of other things that are currently not being dealt with basically they are it, their rights have been violated and this is their only kickback constitutionally to do anything about it and it's and it's a legal kickback i mean they have their pursuit of happiness too they have the right to sit on the ground for hours in protest of something that they think is unfair because there's not another there's not another recourse for them legally to do anything about it i mean i think if, you know, they your your right to pursue happiness absolutely has to do with as long as you're not hindering someone else. But it but it also has a lot to do with your right to pursue justice also. And I think I think that there is there is something to what's happening right now in that people are just at a place where they are fed up and they want to be listened to and they want their rights held upheld. And a lot of those rights. Are imp I mean, they're just as important as somebody's right to be. You said like a right to be in a park without you being there. If somebody told me to leave a public park, I'd kick them in the shin. I'd be like, listen, this is a public park. That's what public means. You, you don't tell me where I get to be and don't be. If you don't enjoy the fact that I'm here, you have the right to leave. You know? Right, but we're, I mean, ta I, but we're, I, I, we're talking a college, guys, we're talking a college campus in this right. particular case, though. So. And, 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 well, if I was sitting on the lawn of my college campus, I'd pay a lot to be here every year. I would expect that that would be that would be within my rights. I mean, I'm you know I'm an MBA student. I'm in school. Well, that's, I, have a, that's, I have a quad that I could occupy if I were angry about something. Right, but that's that's assuming that all of these occupiers are enrolled in that university. I who's think, who's I mean, to I say think, that fifty percent of, of the people sitting there aren't enrolled in that university? Now they're just I, mean, assumptions. I I think I understand I I understand sort of where you guys are coming from and I understand the the truth of of the matter and the eviction notices and all that sort of stuff. All but right. at the end of the day, the pepper spray, as we all agreed. Oh, that was wrong. Right. Yeah, and and you can't you you can't get over the fact that it's it's a really there've been a there's been a lot of press lately about cops 
being angry about people, and you guys know this happened in Boston, actually, uh, cops being angry about people having personal cell phone devices and recording when they thought someone rights, someone's rights were being violated, and the police were saying, oh, that's a, you know, that you're, you're violating my right. And now, because of Occupy Oakland, they're actually making, well, they're in, in a certain area of this country, they are making police officers wear cameras to ensure that they don't do things that are outside of the law. And, you know, their job, I do not, I do not want their job. I know that they are constantly on the line between good and evil and doing what they have to do to protect the rest of us. And I don't envy that position. But I, but I got to say, I think that what has come out of things like this has been good for America overall. You know, and I think it is important that someone filmed this so that we knew that there was injustice because otherwise people would just be saying, hey, the guy felt threatened, he pepper sprayed someone. Anyway, uh, the next thing I have up, and I don't know if I, this is just something I found, by a guy named Steve Pond, that celebrities are, are going back to jury duty as an econ, as economy kills special treatment. Apparently, that uh, jury that in, um, I believe it's California, or it might be New York. No, it was in New York. That if a, if oh, a I was going to say, I wouldn't believe California. New York, I'm actually kind of well, surprised. No, it's, no, it's, 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 it's New York. But every November, a group of celebrities who had been called for jury duty over the past year would assemble in Manhattan Superior Court as part of a statewide juror appreciation day where they talk to high school kids about the importance of serving. They would sit there and talk to these kids about serving and get and get excused for two years. And now they're all complaining because that practice has been stopped at the edge. The economy kills a special treatment. I just thought people would like to hear about that one. It's just fun. That's now, I one. understand that some people view this as special treatment, and don't get me wrong, I show up for jury duty when I have to go because of what my mother told me when I was a kid. If we don't go to jury duty, those of us with real jobs and real responsibilities don't go to jury duty, the only people who are there are the people who have nothing better to do, and you don't want those being the only people That's on right. your jury should you ever need one. But on the flip side... These people are famous enough that they were getting out of jury duty before, which means they're famous enough that they could distract from the process. That's right. I mean, from a judicial point of view, I don't want Jennifer Aniston on my jury. I doubt that I would get a fair trial if Jennifer Aniston didn't like what I was doing or somebody, you know, or people were playing to Jennifer, you know, whoever, Angelina Jolie, if you prefer, you know, whatever side of that fence you fall on, you know, Tom Cruise. I don't want those people on my jury. I really think it'd be a distraction. Yeah, it, it's it, supposed it, to be a jury of your peers, and they're certainly not your peers. Well, I've never seen a jury of anybody's peers anyway. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't agree. I think when I went for jury duty, I you know it was actually in Boston because I had been there long enough, and I was you have to be a resident, you know, to get your driver's license and everything there. And I I felt like the people I was with was a very good selection of my peers. It was people of all ages, and you oh, know, I, I want to and, yeah, and that's how it's supposed to be. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, but I gotta say, I, those people are not my peers. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not. No, I don't want to think. I, I've met some of those people. I don't want them as my peers. So, Holly, before we before Fred gets into his little kind of a, a weird uh, top story oh, here yeah. of the week, why don't you lighten it up a little bit of this week's entertainment news and tech news, and then Fred could pick up his uh, butt story. <laughs> well, this this was a great week for nerds like me, um, and I say that in the most flattering form because obviously I'm very fond of myself. Um, but the Twilight, the fourth film in the Twilight series opened this weekend. It is the beginning of the finale book. They split the book into two parts, a la Harry Potter. Uh, and the part one came out this weekend, $280 million. I was in the audience. Um, you know, I'd say Twilight fans go. It's very true to the book. You know, however you feel about uh, our past and Case Stu and uh, Taylor Lautner, they're all still there. All your faves are still in the movie, very well represented. Um, my favorite character in the films is uh, is, is uh, Billy Boyd, who plays Charlie, Bella's dad, and he was in rare form and got some really good moments in this movie. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to ruin it how much – I'm not going to give away where they're ending or any of that in case any any of the fans out there haven't seen it. But, uh, but I would definitely say if you're a fan of the series, go. Oh, it's very true to the book. I just want to know how many vampires die. Ooh, well, in this film, actually, I uh, I would say no vampires die. Ooh. I do have a question. Now, you said this this is the final chapter, or that you've been split in half. Is not going to make a uh, Twilight 5? Yes, they're going to make a Twilight 5, if you will, uh, called Breaking Dawn Part 2. This was okay, so that's the second Dawn, half of this one. Yeah, this was Part 1. Okay, Correct. Well, you know, they, uh, they divided the final book into uh, two movies, 
Right. Uh, they did that for the Harry Potter series, and obviously the movie studios went, sweet, we can make so much more money off this. As a well, reader, well, obviously you love it because you get more stuff, but you well, can't get you're uh, being gouged. This is going to be the end of the story, though. The, uh, this the, the is the not the movie. end. The end of the story will be in the next movie. Yeah. Okay, so Very it's on the next movie. So you guys still have plenty of time to block watch and catch up. Well, no, what I'm saying, what I'm asking, but they're not going to be Twilight 6. No, no Twilight 6, only Twilight 5. Unless they decide to, which I don't think they will because they used her so much in the actual Eclipse film. There is a Twilight novella that is a uh, companion to the book series called The Short Second Life of Bree Tanner. Okay. And they do have, I mean, obviously, Stephanie Myers is popular enough at this point. They do have the option to turn that into a movie. Her other book series, The Host, has uh, been picked up for a movie contract. So, I mean, we don't know where that, you know, you guys know how that sort of stuff happens. People option the script every day. Um, but, the, but those are things you may see coming down the pike. They are a possibility. But as far as the actual Twilight series, as of now, Twilight 5, if you will, or Breaking Dawn Part 2, will be the last movie in the series. Okay. So you guys, like I said, you guys have plenty of time to block, watch, and catch up. I know you, you really have a heart for Edward. <laughs> and I hear you have a, a new device that you can watch the t- Twilight series on now. Oh, yes, indeed. I, along with many other people, got my Kindle Fire this past week. And I have to say, I have a uh, strategy professor who is a huge Apple enthusiast, and he, of course, said Apple safe. I, I played with it, no problem. But the truth of the matter is, Apple fans, I, it is a tablet. That is all it does. It does what a tablet can do. You surf the web. You watch your movies. I love it. I find it very charming. Um, obviously, it comes with a couple, three months of Amazon Prime, which I'm already really enjoying because you get, uh, you get e-books for free. Uh, once a month, you can you can borrow basically from the from the Amazon library. I'm reading the second book of The Hunger Games. I downloaded it. That was the first thing I put on my Kindle Fire, and <laughs> I I love it. I mean, it it is to me, it's everything I hoped it would be. It's easy to use, very user friendly. I think you could just be a complete moron and totally pull it off, and I like that. I, I it's more user friendly than any of the other PC devices I've ever owned, and I just love it. I I mean, I like Amazon's model anyway, but I I like it. There you go. Along the same lines, I just picked up a tablet myself. Um, these tablets Ooh. are everything that people make them out to be. I went with a, um, I, I won't mention the brand name because they're, uh, they're not paying us. Oh, okay. um, but I picked up a, um, a tablet, a uh, full-size tablet that's running Android. Uh, only don't because the name, we can't compare Only them. because it's got a uh, 10.1, well, it's, it's running Android... Um, uh, honeycomb, so it it really doesn't matter to manufacturer. It's the operating system, so any tablet running honeycomb would be comparable. Um, so I'm just speaking of Android honeycomb, uh, but it's got the 10.1 screen. That's Thank the only you. reason I went with it as opposed to the Fire, which I was going to pick up. I just figured that I would enjoy the 10.1 screen a little bit better than the seven inch screen. And I was right, wasn't I? Yeah, I I love it, but but Holly, it's you know we're not going to talk apples and oranges here. It's the same thing primarily. Um, I feel exactly the same way you do. Um, I love this tablet. I, I sold a netbook. I don't even use my desktop computer as much anymore. I use my desktop computer now just for business work, for all of the base net production stuff that needs to be done on a hardcore desktop computer. But I live on my tablet it is just awesome. So I, yep, I agree with you a thousand percent. And my son's well, got my, my stepson's got one. He's got a tablet, ten and a half inch screen, different brand than yours, but that's it, it, he loves it. It's it, it's the best thing going. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I I I like mine. Like I said, I think there's still some things it's limited to, but it does everything a tablet should do at this point in time. And I love and I love that about it. But I also um I uh. I, it's a lot lighter, you know, than my laptop with the, yep. uh, I have one of those big batteries that has like ridiculous amounts of life, which means people pick up my backpack and go, holy smoke. What kind of battery life are you getting? Have you put it through the ringer yet? Oh yeah. I, on, on the, uh, on the fire, I haven't really had to, I didn't really have to charge it at all 
I mean, the first, let's see, I got it on the 18th. It's the 21st now. I, I did charge it, but I charged it because I was charging something else, and I thought to so plug it in, but I had, anyway. had it on and was yeah. using it, yeah. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, like, use, I use my tablet 12-plus uh, hours a day, and I have never gone below 32% remaining on the battery. So I'm getting 12-plus hours, which pff, that's phenomenal. awesome. I that's can't ask phenomenal. for anything better than that. That's just phenomenal. Yeah, that's, and that's, just, about what, that's about what Tim's getting on his. Okay, so um, that's our entertainment news of the week. Fred, uh, what do we have next? Well, you don't talk about entertainment news. I got a better entertainment for you. Um, this comes out of the uh, out of Miami. Uh, actually, it's last week, but it's something I thought it was, was, was uh, very, very strange. And uh, Miami Gardens transgender woman is facing charges of practicing medicine without a license after the police say... She injected a patient's rear with everything but the kitchen sink in an illegal cosmetic surgery procedure. The person's name is O'Neill Ron Morris, 30. And remember, it's transgender. That's why the name uh, is uh, beyond investigation. Miami Gardens Police and Florida Department of Health. According to the police, the victim saw Mar Morris in May and was injected in her buttocks with a substance consisting of cement, fixer flat, mineral oil and super glue. And that's enough of that. <laughs> what a combination. But, but they, we, they, do, we do have a clip. Why don't we go to the clip yeah, and then go you can to that take first. it back up. Come back. Police say that O'Neill Ron Morris injected patients and then sealed the wounds with super glue. Tonight, the daughter of a woman who died under similar circumstances is speaking out about this. In Morris's case, Miami Gardens police say he injected the victim's buttocks with cement, mineral oil, and fix-a-flat, then sealed the incision with super glue. The victim wound up in the hospital. Morris wound up in jail. Miami Gardens police say O'Neill Morris practiced medicine without a license, injecting a woman's rear end with dangerous products, first used them on himself. We're told Morris's victim suffered pneumonia and MRSA from the injection. This cocktail of, com of chemicals went into her body, caused a terrific Cause her terrific pain. I lost my mother to something senseless that could have been avoided. Tangela Sears is not familiar with O'Neill Morris, but she is intimately familiar with the illegal practice of medicine. Her mother, Vera Lawrence, died 10 years ago after receiving silicone injections at house parties. Sears says the men who injected her mother were not doctors, and she wants others to avoid the pain her family suffers. If you're being injected outside of a doctor's office, it's with some type of chemical that's either going to cripple you and kill you immediately or eventually you're going to die. Dr. Rainier Saxe is a plastic surgeon in Fort Lauderdale. He says people must do their research before allowing someone to inject a substance into their bodies. I understand people trying to you know, find a shortcut. Sometimes it might work, but more often than not, it probably doesn't work. And then it's sad, you know, something like that can happen. Police say O'Neill Morris's victim learned that lesson the hard way. You know, Fred, I said it last week for your story. I'm going to say it again this week, too. I yes, love these. Please. I love these stories. Fred knows how to pick his stories, doesn't he? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, I mean these, these kind of things are just, are just are just out there. And I mean, how do you sit there and do something like this? And then, I mean, I'm sorry, but I mean, that to me is un first of all, it's unconscionable to people that somebody would do this. And I mean, you walk in for a butt injection, it's got to be 30 bucks. You got to know something's going on. I mean, but fix a flat. I mean, it's probably this woman's not dead. Yeah, like, like, we, like we heard in the clip, uh, you know, the comments he made about just like what you just said, Fred. You know, if, there's, if you're looking to save a buck, um, I don't know that this is necessarily the kind of place that you're going to go looking to try to save a buck because you're going to get some kind of quack out there. I mean, you know, it, the, the article goes on to say that the the uh, an amateur incision was uh, was sealed with super glue. The victim later was hospitalized for serious medical conditions as a result of the injections. Morris, who I mean, it, it, the Morris, who the police say is a man, and appears to be like a woman in sports and apparently enhanced butt herself in a, in a rest for it. This is just strange. Was being held in seventy five hundred dollars bond. I mean, they got to put these people away. I mean. But I mean, if again, you don't save money in, uh, in cosmetics. I mean, too many people are out there complaining about facelifts, and these are professionals doing it. This woman's gonna be ruined for the rest of her life, and because somebody's playing games with super glue and fix a flat, I mean that that should be a temporary. Oh, and there was some cement in there too, also, right? Like cement. Yes, yeah, cement. Yeah, yeah cement. Uh, I mean, I've heard the special junk in the trunk, but that's ridiculous. 
Oh, you went Disney Seasource. I, I don't have anything better than the junk in the trunk. I, gotta oh, be well, well, with I the, wasn't going to go there. I swear I wasn't. With the junk in the trunk, did you guys have any other stories, or are we going to go with our Holly and the Lobster Tale? For Let's the go to Holly and Lobster Tales. <laughs> All right. Lab- yeah. Larry, welcome to the show. Well, we have Larry the Lobster <laughs> Marks here. And uh, Larry, what are you and Holly going to talk about today? And me and Fred are going to zip ourselves here. Uh, you guys have some fun. <laughs> Okay, well, I found some very interesting little uh, things that, well, at least they were interesting to me. But, so here's the first one. Rubber bands last longer when refrigerated. Are you going to do the whole list, Larry, first, or are we going to take these out one at a time? Oh, well, that's the first one. The second one is the name Jeep comes from the term used in the Army for the general purpose vehicle. The next one is the main library at Indiana, at Indiana University sinks one inch every year because the engineers fail to take into account the weight of all the books in the building. And the last one is peanuts are one of the ingredients in dynamite. Well, okay, so what other kind of things last longer if you put them in the fridge there? Is it, you know, is it just, is it just because, I mean, what does it do to the chemistry of the rubber band? That is a really good question. <laughs> if I put my face in the fridge, will I age more slowly? Oh. Um. Did he say they, that the rubber bands last longer than the refrigerators or last longer in the refrigerator? No. Rubber bands, yeah, last, is... rubber bands last longer when refrigerated. Oh, okay, well, when so refrigerated. Then, but then when you take them out, eventually don't they lose whatever benefit they got from being in the refrigerator in the first place? I mean, molecularly, I feel like the benefits of refrigeration have to be pretty short-lived. Probably within a minute after they come out of the refrigerator, they've lost those benefits. Put them in the freezer, they yeah. snap. Right. Yeah, that's what I would think. All right. Yeah, that's, so so, yeah, so, the, so I guess I guess we're going to have to turn the refrigerator, the refrigerator and the rubber bands over to the guys from the Mythbusters and see what they could find out. So what else I was on your list? I would love to see that Mythbuster. Actually, the library one, Larry, I thought was really interesting, you know, especially since everybody, we were all talking about our new tablet computers, which, you know, mine, of course, was born of an e-reader, and I think a lot of people use their tablets as Libraries e-readers. are getting lighter these days, so maybe it Indeed. won't sink anymore. Our architects can now sleep better at night, an unintended consequence of the e-book revolution. I think it's interesting, though, that the, that the weight of the books is making the... Uh... Make the library sink every year. That's certainly, interesting. Because... Certainly makes sense. You know, they because makes a lot ob- of sense. Obviously, a mechanical or a structural engineer does take all of that into consideration. And if the engineer simply forgot about the additional weight of all of those tens of thousands of books, well, we're not hiring to put sure. to build our offices. I'm telling you right what, now. That's for sure. All right. And what well, were you... three and four on this list? Well, you know, my uh, my sister-in-law is an architect, and this is actually more common than you would think. Uh, this, this is the kind of thing a lot of architects don't take into account. You know, she and she and her husband both are very big on the actual functionality of architecture, and and you know, this is you know, you you get the guy to build the library who big who builds the big beautiful building, but he may or may not have any idea of the engineering backlash of such a building once lots and lots of books are placed in it. So yeah, that that actually happens more often than you think. Now, Larry, what was what was the what was the second one you said? The second one is the name Jeep comes from the term used in the army for the general purpose vehicle. Well, that is true. It actually comes from the letters GP for general purpose. It's also the rumor out there. It was also in uh, some places they say it was named after the car- the old Popeye character of the Jeep, but that's more of a secondary rumor. But it is the Jeeps were designed by. Um, Designed by the U.S. government, and they were able to be uh, – the, the reason the Jeeps were so well done and called general purpose that all the Jeeps made were not only made by Willis Overland. They were made by Willys. They were made by Ford, made by Chevy, and they all had interchangeable parts. The specifications were the same on all the vehicles made by all the manufacturers. They could be interchangeable. Well, Very that's good. actually interesting because, you know, some of the problems that they're having nowadays with the contractors and the vehicles that they build, you think sometimes maybe we ought to go back to the old Jeep. Yeah, with interchangeable parts and all. 
Well, because it didn't matter. You could stock you could stock an order from any any supplier, and when you had Ford parts or General Motors parts or Willys Overland parts, the parts would fit that particular Jeep. And so it's a GP or general purpose. And then later on, after they uh, they stopped, they they saw with this with the CJ or civilian Jeep, right. the DJ for the post service for for uh, delivery Jeep, and the uh, military became MJs at that point. Right. So, oh. but I like the Larry's last story, though. The fact that uh, peanuts are in dynamite. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, they're one of the ingredients in dynamite. Okay, Which <laughs> I, I was discussing this with Larry when he was first putting out his email about these topics. And if you remember back with um, Timothy McVeigh and Oklahoma City bombing, that was primarily fertilizer. That's so right. I was aware of the fact that fertilizer is an ingredient in dynamite or is dynamite. Uh, but certainly wasn't aware of peanuts. That makes sense. We'll have to get, we'll have to get Jimmy Carter on, I guess, and see what Jimmy Carter has to say about it. Yeah, guys, guys, I don't know what this says about me, but the only jokes I have in mind are terrible, inappropriate bathroom humor. Um, <laughs> Thanks for being me halfway on that. I'll, I'll allow the audience to uh, to go where they will with that comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I learned a lot today. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Lair. Yep. Well, one thing is, I guess... After hearing that about peanuts being one of the ingredients in dynamite, maybe the next time you eat peanuts, you might want to chew carefully. Yeah, right. I, I shall eat peanuts with caution. I assure you. Okay. <laughs> and and with that, if we no, have nothing it. else, uh, I guess that's the end of our topics for today. Yeah, that's, that's it for me, man. Well, we we actually we got a shout out uh, from a famous celebrity this week. I think it's important to mention. Okay, go ahead. Well, uh, you know, Stephen Colbert apparently has been reading the Fred Boas book of uh, totally gross stories and uh, picked up on our vodka story from last week. I think we have a clip, actually. Tap that. Teens taking tampons, soaking them in vodka, and inserting them there. No wonder the women in these commercials look so happy. Guys will also use it, and they'll, they'll insert them into their rectums. Everywhere in America. Boys are soaking tampons and vodka and literally getting drunk off their asses. Were you ever well, you know, I love the Colbert show, so I was pretty excited about that. But, you know, Fred, I didn't realize that you and Colbert were so tight. Hey, 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 hey. he's my bud, man. He's my bud. What can I tell you? <laughs> All right, so I guess um, that just about does it for our slightly delayed uh, Sunday edition on a Tuesday of show number 18 of As We See It. Uh, coming up on this Sunday's show, we will be uh, hopefully getting back onto our normal schedule. So that's a few days after Thanksgiving, so if everybody's recuperated from their turkey by then, uh, give us a listen. We're going to be talking about the... Um, City of Los Angeles reopening the Natalie Wood drowning case from back in 1981, I believe it was. 81, 80, 30 years I ago. Um, yep, we're going to talk about that on Sunday. Uh, myself and Fred were both out there at the time in the Los Angeles area or in California. You might have been up north at that point, weren't you? No, I was in L.A. Today. You were in L.A., okay. Yep, so we were out there at that time. And um, so... There's a little cliffhanger for you, a little teaser. Coming up on Sunday, we'll be uh, kicking around the Natalie Wood story. So from Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. From the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, I'm Fred Boaz. And from somewhere on the road, I'm Holly Hurley. And from Brooklyn, Massachusetts, I'm the Lobster. Lobster.